presentations, but to make informed estimates during mixing, perform accurate editing and dynamic producing. In order for us to understand how to approach mixing, composing and editing in a DAW, we need to understand how to measure what we are doing. For this reason, it is important to know what all the numbers mean. In today's lesson, we'll have a look at tempo, time and metering and how to use rhythm to create music. A really big welcome from all of us here at Shaw Academy, where we are here to help you learn the skills you need to succeed today. My name is Matthias and I am your sound engineering educator. Very welcome to the professional diploma in sound engineering here at Shaw Academy, module one, lesson three. What do all the numbers mean? In today's lesson, we'll have a look at tempo, time and metering, and how to use rhythm to create music and manipulate sound. The objectives for today's lesson include understanding tempo and beats, measuring time and tempo, setting time signatures for musical effect, and making a clean recording. Tempo is a very interesting aspect of sound engineering and music production. It is the musical way of measuring time, and you can regard it as the speed at which musical notes are being performed. In order for us to understand tempo and the role that it plays in music, we need to understand what it is, how we measure it, and what the aspects of tempo are that we can manipulate. If you play an instrument, have done music production, or have friends that practice music, you'll probably be familiar with the term BPM, or beats per minute. The term is exactly what its title states. It's the number of beats in a minute. As a general guideline, our default tempo is 120 BPM, or 120 beats per minute. And each of these beats are called a quarter note. A group of beats is called a bar. In most popular music, a bar has four quarter note beats, which we call a time signature, and is indicated as 4-4. Four, four. You can also have different time signatures, such as 2-4, which is a march, 3-4, a waltz, and even 5-4, which is what Dave Brubeck used to compose his famous song, Take 5. To give you a better understanding, this is how we set it in our DAWs. Depending on the type of song that you would want to write, the time signature that you choose might play an important role in this. So in reason, if you look at the bottom, we can change our time signature over here. As you can see, we are currently in 4-4. This means that we have four quarter note beats in a bar. And for reference, it sounds like this. One, two, three, four. Okay, pretty straightforward, right? Now, if we want to have a bar with three quarter note beats in it, we could just simply change that to a three. And now we have a typical waltz rhythm. One, two, three, one, two, three, four. Da, 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 da. Perfect, right? Now, let's say we want to write a march, then we can change it to two, four. Have a look at this. Ta 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 one two one two ta 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 and these kind of patterns that you can see now you get them everywhere in music and depending on what the feel is that you want you can change your time signature you can even switch between time signatures in the middle of your song in classical music. Tempo is indicative of the feel of a certain part of a composition and changes quite often. It tells us whether we need to speed up, slow down, or maintain our current pace. In modern music, however, tempo changes are much less common. The vast majority of songs today are set at a fixed tempo from start to finish. Where classical music uses tempo to indicate the speed and emotional essence of a certain musical passage, in modern music it indicates genre. The reason for this is because in modern music, especially popular music, the tempo is fixed. The result of this is that we often define our genres based on the feel that a genre has additional to the instrumentation. As an example, the average tempo for hip hop is 85 to 115 BPM, funk 120 to 125, pop 90 to 135, rock 110 to 140, house and techno 115 to 128, drum and bass 175 to 185. 
Now, these are estimates, but are accurate measurements of modern music genres and tempos. Now that we know that tempo is divided into beats, and that the tempo show us how many note beats we have in a minute, such as 120 beats per minute, combining these beats in different groups can result in significant differences in the musical outcome. Besides quarter notes, we have an entire host of other note links that we can use to set the tempo of a song. The notes we get are whole notes, which are equal to a bar regardless of time signature. Half notes, which are equal to two beats, quarter notes equal to one beat, eighth notes equal to half a beat, and sixteenth notes, which are equal to a quarter beat. To make writing music in rhythms even easier, we also have dotted notes. When a note is dotted, we indicate it like this image. All that it means when we say that a note is dotted is that the note is one and a half times longer. If we have a dotted quarter note, we will play the note as long as a quarter note plus an eighth note together. As an example, in a three, four time signature, we can play the length of three quarter notes in a bar like this. As you can see, the time signature in the bottom is three, four, which means that we have three quarter notes in every bar. So just to demonstrate this a little bit clearer, I'm going to add some of this radical piano. And then I will just simply draw in some notes for us that we can play and we can listen back to. So 16th notes, that's a little bit too tight for me. For now, I'm going to prefer it on quarter notes. So let's keep it on that. And if I scroll down, you can see that. If, and if I just simply play it, you will hear a one note on every beat. Pretty simple, right? Okay, so let's expand a little bit on this idea. I'm going to change our grid settings to eighth notes because this will make it a little bit easier for us to edit on this. Then let me zoom in a bit more so that we all can see this a bit clearer. Okay, so what we have at the moment is just the note C on every strong beat and one on the strong beat and on two and three on the weak beats. So I feel that this dun 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 is pretty boring and I think we can spice it up a bit by at least turning it into a waltz. So these two notes, I will move them up to my G and then I can duplicate them and I will move them up to the C. And now I've got the C over here, the G over there, another C over there. Pretty simple. And let's have a listen to what this sounds like. Okay, that's something more realistic. Let's copy and paste that and see what this sounds like. Okay, so this is a pretty clear waltz, right? We can all distinguish this. One, two, three, one, two, three. But what if we don't necessarily want to have the feeling of a waltz? What if we want to use the dotted note rhythms that we have available and change the feel of the three, four to something else? So for this purpose, what I'm going to do is I will extend my first note all the way through. So I'm playing a whole note, which fills the bar. But in this case, it's the length of the dotted half note. Then for these two, I will move them there. Now remember, we are working in eighth notes. One, two, three, four, five, six. One quarter note, two quarter notes, three quarter notes. This is our three, four bar. Okay. So if I want to make these ones dotted, I just have to add another eighth note onto that, like this. And the same goes for these ones. I need to add another eighth note onto that. And now suddenly we're not playing a waltz anymore. Now it became something else. Let's copy and paste this. And then I will delete that one and copy paste these ones as well. Now let's have a listen to what this sounds like. Now you can see we just created a 
pass with them in the Go change some of the notes and go have a lot of fun with it. Now that you understand what tempo is and that we measure it in beats per minute, we can begin to investigate rhythm. We all understand what a beat is and how it feels. When music plays and we jump and dance to the music, we are feeling the beat. In modern music, where the time signature is 4 4, the strong beats are beats 1 and 3, and the weak beats are beats 2 and 4. In a waltz, which is 3-4, the strong beat is beat 1, and the weak beats are beats 2 and 3. Off beats help us a lot to create interesting rhythms. It can also help us to create a bounce and a groove to our music. And it usually falls on the and. So when we count, it usually goes 1 and, 2 and, 3 and, 4 and. Now that you know what strong beats, weak beats, and off beats are, let's see how we can use them to create a little bit of more spicing music. So for this purpose, I think I'm going to bring in some drum tracks into this. I think for today, let's go have a look at some of the house music. Let's see what drums we have over here. I quite like this. Let's duplicate that. But for now, I'm just going to keep it over here. Then, if we open this, then you can see that the kick drum, which is this big squiggly line, this falls on the strong beats. One, two, three, four, one, two, three. So if I press play, So as you can see, it's one and three is the strong beat, and two and four are the weak beat. One, three, one, three. Okay, makes a lot of sense, right? So now we have our little loop over here, nice, comfortable 120 BPM for <coughs> time signature. And I think we should add a little bass to this. Now, honestly, the subtractor analog synth, if you drag, drag and drop this in, the default bass on this sounds quite nice. Um, so I think I'm just going to draw some notes into this. Let's just start with one bar for now. And then I will bring our loop marker a little bit closer so we can just loop that bar. And now, just for demonstrative purposes, I'm just going to write one note on every beat. So one, two, three, four. I will write four notes. And I think for this, let's do it in F. Let's see what that sounds like. Maybe that's a little bit high. That sounds nice. I think I quite enjoy that. So then let's just duplicate that. Once again, one last time. And now let's copy paste and see what this sounds like. Okay, not bad, not bad. We got something going. But honestly, I think that if we just move these ones up one more so that it falls on the and because right now you can see the strong beats are here one two three and four but if we move it on the and then it's one and two and three and and let's see the difference between these two bars over here i will delete this one so 
Shift that there. Let's have a look. So that's a very obvious difference, right? So I think let's delete that and let's just keep these offbeats. Okay, so now we've got something going. As you can see, it did add quite a lot of bounce to it. But what what if we move this one to the strong beat? What would that do? And now you can see just by even playing one note, not even changing the bass notes, we have some group, we have some feel going on. And you can start playing around with these kind of ideas, chop and changing the notes, see which rhythms work, which ones don't, focus on the strong beats and the off beats, and play around with them until you find something that works for you. Time and duration are extremely important terms to us. They are crucial aspects of sound engineering, and therefore we have more than one way to relate to time. In this section, we will discuss how time is measured and how to keep effective track of your session. We measure time in two ways. Firstly, we measure time as an absolute value. What this means is that we all know one second is as long as one second. This way of measuring time is great, especially for video editing. But what if we wanted to record or produce music? This is where tempo bars and beats come into play. The length of a note depends on the tempo. At a slower tempo, let's say 60 BPM, the length of a quarter note is twice as long than if we were to play it at 120 BPM. This is the musical way of measuring time. In sound engineering, we have time as an absolute value and we also have time with its flexible musical value, namely tempo. We use a watch or a clock to measure the passing of time. To measure musical time as tempo, we use a metronome. This way we are able to slow musical time down and speed it up as we see fit. The same way that a watch keeps track of time, a metronome keeps track of musical time. It's also often referred to as a click track due to the clicking pulse it makes, and it sounds like this. Our metronome is particularly important because musicians use it to make sure they are playing in sync with the song and each other. It is also important because it tells us how far in the bar we are, 
the tempo of the music, and therefore the duration of our notes. Setting the metronome or click is very simple and can be done here. Right, so let's say that we have this idea. We quite like it, but let's say we want it a little bit faster or maybe a little bit slower. This is where our tempo comes into play. So let's just listen to the basic idea that we have, just to make sure that we're all familiar with it. Okay, that's our loop. So let's say we want it a little bit faster. What would that sound like? Let's speed it up to 135 and see what happens. Oh, this sounds super 90s. It's definitely not what I'm going to go for right now. Let's take it down one ten. You see now, because we went a little bit too low, the audio warp is starting to sound a little bit funny. Listen to those sounds. In here, it's a little bit clicky. If we go down to 100, it will become even more. Okay, so let's go to 115. I think that will be, that will sound okay. Yeah, that sounds nice. in a creative process and you just want to come up with some new ideas, then you can change the tempo. But usually, if you want to start recording, you need to make your tempo beforehand because the entire song will be based on that. Just like you see now, sometimes audio walking and stretching doesn't really work that well. In the next lesson, we are going to learn how to build great sounding chords without the need of learning music notation. If tempo is the musical way of keeping time, bars and beats can be regarded as the musical hours and minutes. The top number in the time signature tell us how many beats we have in a bar. In this case, we have three beats. The bottom number tell us how long these beats are, which is a quarter note in this instance. In this example, we say that the time signature is 3-4. To us, this means that the bar length is equal to three quarter notes. The tempo show us how many of the bottom notes will be played in a minute. This is how speed control is achieved through tempo. So if we have 100 beats a minute and the time signature is a normal 4-4 time, we can safely say that 100 divided by 4 gives us 25 bars of music. This is quite helpful because now we can begin to understand the context of our music production. If you want a song to be three minutes long and want to add an intro, verse, chorus, bridge, and maybe even repeat some of those parts, we can begin to plan the estimated length of the different sections that we want to create. Generally, different sections of songs are grouped in bar lengths of eight. As an example, an intro might be eight bars long, the verse 16, bridge eight, and the chorus eight, which often gets repeated and ends up being 16 bars long anyway. In the next lesson, we'll discuss music theory for sound engineers, and I'll show you how to create great sounding chords without the need to study music notation. But first, let's have a look at metering in our DAWs and make sure that we understand what the numbers are telling us. The meters in our DAWs tell us a lot about what we are doing and how much we are doing it. We use it to measure any processing we do and how much we are affecting signals in the many ways possible. In this third section of our lesson, we will look at the meters we have in our DAWs, how to read them correctly, and make sure that you deliver quality audio every time. In lessons one and two, we spoke about sound waves and that sound is a pressure wave moving through air. Interestingly, our ears don't hear all frequencies equally loud. Our ears are much more sensitive to higher frequencies than lower frequencies, and consequently, we perceive loudness on an exponential scale rather than a linear one. We measure loudness in two ways. The first is to measure sound pressure level from a sound wave. This we measure in decibel, but because we don't hear all frequencies equally, 
this only works for sound pressure and not for how loud we perceive sound. In order for us to measure loudness and how we perceive it, we use fonts, where one font is equal to one decibel. In 1933, Fletcher and Munson devised a set of curves that represent human loudness perception over the range of audible frequencies of 20 hertz to 20,000 hertz. What they discovered was that our ears become increasingly less sensitive the lower frequencies are. The curve in this image showed the sound pressure level needed to play all the frequencies over the audible spectrum equally loud. This curve shows that for us to perceive 20 hertz and 1000 hertz equally loud, we need to play the low 20 hertz tone at almost 130 fon and the 1000 hertz tone at 90 fon, an entire 40 fon or decibel lower. There is a difference between sound power and loudness. For sound power, if a sound has 60 decibel of power, that same signal will have double the amount of power at 63 decibel, four times at 66 and eight times more at 69 decibel. However, the decibel scale is exponential. And this means that in order for us to perceive a doubling in loudness, we need to increase the signal with six to 10 decibel, not just three. So even though a sound might have twice as much power, does not mean that we will hear the sound twice as loud. The human perception of sound functions a little differently from sound pressure levels. As an example, a signal at 60 decibel will be twice as loud at 70 decibel and four times as loud at 80 decibel. That same sound will be eight times louder at 90 decibel. Due to the exponential rate at which loudness increases, the last 10 decibel from 80 decibel to 90 decibel quadrupled the sound intensity where the first 10 decibel increase from 60 to 70 was only a doubling in intensity. To truly understand the difference between low and high frequency perception, and that our hearing functions on an exponential scale rather than a linear one. Listen to these tones being played at the same loudness, and notice how the sound is becoming louder as frequency moves up, even though the signal stays at the same level. You will see the output meter on the right is constant at minus 12. Pay attention to the frequency and how loud or soft it sounds. Notice how the lower frequencies feel extremely soft and the higher frequencies super loud. This is the strange and wonderful way that we hear sound. Now just please keep your fingers on the volume control. This is going to feel extremely loud once we've passed the 200 hertz mark. We don't hear all frequencies equally loud, and this is clear after seeing and hearing our perception at equal loudness levels. Like in the previous clip, when we record sound, we need to keep three basic principles in mind. Input, headroom, and clipping. Your input is the source of the sound that you want to record. It can be from a microphone, a direct line input like an electric guitar, or from software like digital instruments and plugins. Headroom is the amount by which your input signal have room for dynamic changes. Clipping is the distortion of your input signal if you exceed your headroom. In the same way that we don't hear all frequencies equally, our microphones, instruments, and digital instruments don't produce or capture frequencies at equal loudness levels. In fact, everything produces its own set of frequencies at different loudness levels based on the harmonic series. And that is what we call timbre. Now, because the world around us produces frequencies at different loudness levels, we have dynamics in our music and recordings. Finding a balance between all of these frequencies and their loudness levels is the key to producing a great mix. So, when we record sound, we need to keep an eye on our faders and meters. We want to capture and record all our sound as clean as possible and stay true to the original audio as much as we can. For this reason, we need to at all times avoid clipping. Clipping is when you exceed the maximum threshold of your fader and recording format and distort your audio signal beyond repair. It's always indicated by red lights at the top of your fader and should be avoided at all times. If you see that a track is clipping, 
this should sound all the alarms in your vicinity and you should tend to the clipping track immediately. It's recommended for music and speech to have your final output peak at around minus six decibel and preferably not be lower than minus 20. Now the distance between minus six decibel and zero decibel in this case is referred to as headroom. If you work in peak mode, your maximum threshold before clipping is zero decibel. I would recommend to record using RMS or root mean squared. This means that the average loudness of the waveform is measured and not only the peak. This will allow you for even more headroom in your recording and will help you to avoid clipping. Whenever you are recording, you always need to keep an eye on the headroom and whether you are clipping or not and your actual levels that you're getting it in. So let's just have a listen to this song and see where our levels are actually peaking. Okay, so as you can see, our drum, the drums are peaking just below zero. Now, that is a little bit dangerous when it comes to mixing. In general, I might just pull that a little bit down. And then I would obviously adjust all my levels according to that. Okay, so now, considering that we only have a bass, let's bring it all the way up to 11. Now, let's go to the bass and see what this is doing. The bass seems that, that like it's much more dynamic. So as you can see, it goes to zero, but then it also drops down all the way down to minus 20. Now, this is helpful to us because this means that our bass has quite a lot of dynamic range. And this brings me to the RMS and peak values. Because you see this empty gap over here between the zero and 12 over here, this is our headroom. And headroom is how much room do we have before we start distorting the signal. Now, what is important for us to notice is that in peak mode, as you can see, we're already at minus 12 and that we only have 12 decibel of headroom. But in VU mode or in RMS mode, we've got 12 plus another 12. So we have 24 decibel of headroom before we start distorting our signal. Now, this is much safer, especially if you don't know how loud the sounds are going to be that's going to come into your microphone. So if I change this to peak mode, you can see we're almost distorting the signal already. If I just push this up a little bit, we get into the thing. Right now, the distortion is very soft. Trust me when I say this, it will get more. And when you start sending your tracks online, that distortion becomes very audible. This is like an exaggerator. You hear that terrible sound? So that is the distortion that I'm saying you should at all times avoid. And that's also why I'm saying you want to record in video mode because it gives you way more headroom. Comfortable, much safer, better sounding audio every time. During recording, everything doesn't always go as planned. We are often confronted with challenges that arise due to the sound source, our equipment, and some inherent limitations in its application. There are two common problems that many people face in their sound engineering careers, regardless of age or experience. The two problems that I'm talking about is the proximity effect and plosives. Let's begin with the proximity effect. When we record with a microphone, due to the design of the microphones, we might struggle with some limitations. One of these limitations is called the proximity effect. Now, remember that sound waves are only pressure waves traveling through the air? Well, they also lose power the further they have to travel. Now, when you place your microphones roughly 30 centimeters or closer to a sound source, such as a voice, a guitar, or a drum, we will hear an increase in bass frequencies the closer that microphone is placed to the sound source. So this increase in low frequencies that we record with our microphones is called the proximity effect. Microphones that are omnidirectional do not suffer from this effect, but cardioid microphones do and most of our microphones are cardioid or a version thereof. Because we as audio engineers know which microphones will produce the proximity effect, we can use it to our advantage. 
One example would be that the proximity effect can add extra low end to a voice, which results in a warm velvet radio voice recording, perfect for a podcast or presentation. This brings me to my second point, plosives. Plosives are letters that we say that produce powerful pressure waves that can clip our recordings. They are the letters that produce a lot of air when we pronounce them, such as P, B, T, K, Q, D, and G. To prevent plosives from exceeding all our carefully planned headroom, we can use a pop filter. Plosives are produced by the human voice, but other sounds with very strong attacks can also clip our recordings. Remember, all the summary notes and slides are available in your toolkit and would be really worthwhile to keep as a resource at your fingertips beyond this course. But no sneak peeks. The lesson notes will only become available after you have attended your class or caught up with the lessons. How are you finding your course so far? Are we living up to our company mission? Are you finding the course flexible and engaging? Are you learning your way? And have you mastered any practical skills? Give Morpheus your feedback or email us on marketing at shoreacademy.com. During this course, 